Hi, this is Andrew from Unitarian Apologetics. Welcome back to the Gospel of John, a Unitarian commentary. This is going to be part two, the prologue. Before we get into the prologue, we're first going to take a look at the background context in Genesis 1, seek to understand Genesis 1 a little more. We're also going to look briefly at the contrast between wisdom and the logos. And then finally, we're going to take this thought process and jump into the prologue and see if we can't make better sense of what's being said in John 1, 1 through 18. Genesis 1, 1 through 2, in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Hebrew, therefore, what is normally translated without form and void is tohu va bohu, which should probably be better translated as desolate wasteland. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was a desolate wasteland and darkness was over the surface of the deep. A brief summary of Genesis 1. The earth is in a rudimentary state. It is chaotic and inhabitable, and God then begins to form and fashion the heavens and earth as we know them today. Then God creates mankind, and on the seventh day, God rests, and there is cosmic harmony. So something interesting happens when we get into the Greek translation, the Septuagint. Genesis 1, 1 through 2 in the Septuagint reads, In the beginning God made the heaven and the earth, but the earth was invisible and unconstructed, and darkness was over the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the water. Ronald Hindle makes an interesting observation In his book, The Text of Genesis 1-11, through he notes, quote, Scholars have noted that auratos, which is the Greek word there for invisible in the Septuagint, auratos is a distinctive philosophical term in Greek used by Plato to denote the unseen pre-existing world of ideas. This choice of a Greek equivalent expresses something of a Platonic cosmology in biblical guise, perhaps joining the cosmologies of Plato and Moses, as was a commonplace in Hellenistic Jewish thought, particularly in Alexandria. Alexandria, of course, is the home of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible for the library there in Alexandria. Alexandria was also the home of the largest Jewish population outside of Jerusalem. Alexandria was also home of Hellenistic Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, which I will be bringing up quite a bit throughout this commentary because I believe that the works of Philo are key to understanding the Gospel of John and at the very least taps us into the Milu in which the Gospel of John was written. Philo here, probably being influenced by the Septuagint rendering of Genesis 1 and influenced by Plato, has quite a different understanding of Genesis 1, as was probably traditional. He sees God as more of an architect who first produces a blueprint through which he makes the cosmos. He writes, quote, a trained architect first sketches in his own mind well nigh all the parts of the city that is to be wrought out. And like a good craftsman, he begins to build the city, keeping his eye upon his pattern and making the visible and tangible objects correspond in each case to the incorporeal ideas. He goes on to write, God, who having determined to found a mighty state, first of all conceived its form in his mind, according to which form he made a world perceptible only to the intellect, 
and then completed one visible to the external senses using the first one as a model. Goes on to write, that world which is perceptible only to the intellect must itself be the archetypal model, the idea of ideas, the logos of God. When we get to Proverbs, we read that Yahweh founded the earth by wisdom and established the heavens by understanding, Proverbs 3.19. I like this quote from Philip McMillian from an article he wrote called Creation and Wisdom. He writes, quote, the message of Proverbs 3.19 is similar to the concept in 8.22, by wisdom the Lord founded the earth. The Hebrew word for founded is also used in the context of God's creation in the Psalms. Wisdom is a part of God's creation from the very beginning, and because of this, there are some paths that follow God's intended design and others that do not. The wise person will seek those paths that are part of God's design and follow them. So what is wisdom? A good explanation of wisdom can be found in an article by Edward Talmadge Root. The article is titled, What is Meant by the Biblical Hakma or Wisdom? He writes that wisdom is first, quote, the world plan, the system of truths, laws, and ideals according to which the universe has been created. But notice one that the fundamental principle of the Hebrew religion had settled so as to exclude all skeptical or philosophical inquiry, the fact that the universe was the creation of a personal God. And to that, therefore, the only step left for Hebrew philosophy to take was to conclude that the world plan existed from the beginning in the mind of God, and constituted the wisdom according to which he directed his action in creation. In this we find the profoundest and the only strictly philosophical idea of Hebrew wisdom. This is the sense of wisdom in Proverbs 8, 22 through 36 and 3, 19 through 20. So when we get to Proverbs 8, we see personified wisdom giving her autobiography she says, the Lord created me as his first course before his works of old. From everlasting, I was established from the beginning. Before the earth began, I was there when he established the heavens. So wisdom is not just to show the function of the cosmos, although it does that. But it's also about moral law through which God created the cosmos. In the Intertestament period, particularly in the book of Sirach, the law of Moses began to be equated with wisdom. Sirach 24, 23, wisdom is the book of the covenant of the Most High God, the law that Moses commanded us as an inheritance for the congregations of Jacob. But he also writes something interesting in Sirach 15.1. Preceding this in chapter 14, he's speaking about the search for wisdom. And then writes in 15.1, whoever fears the Lord will do this, search for wisdom. And whoever holds to the law will obtain wisdom. So wisdom is something that is supposed to be obtained by holding to the law according to the book of Sirach. Now, what this does is, I believe, forms an exclusivism, which says that only those who observe the statutes in the Torah can obtain wisdom. Now, the statutes within the Torah, or Torah observance, can be good, as long as we understand the underlying truth behind its statutes. And a great example of this, which we will look at in the Gospel of John, is observing the Sabbath. A question we want to ask ourselves is, is 
simply taking a day to rest going to lead us to wisdom? Is simply following this statue going to give us wisdom? Instead, I think we should seek to understand first, what is the purpose of the Sabbath? What is the significance of the Sabbath? What does it mean to rest on the Sabbath? Now let us carry this train of thought into the prologue of John and see if we can't make better sense of the prologue than what is traditionally done. John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. John 1.1 1, 1 is traditionally broken down into three parts, A, B, and C. In the beginning was the Logos, that's A, and the Logos was with God, or prostant deon, that's B, and the Logos was Theos, or the Logos was God, John 1.1c. 1, 1, Some of our Unitarian brothers and sisters see the in the beginning of John 1.1 1, 1 as a reference to the new creation and not the Genesis creation. But there's two main points which go against this idea. The first is noted by Norman Peterson in his book, The Gospel of John and the Sociology of Light. He writes, quote, It is important to recognize that a shift in the narrator's point of view takes place in 114 through 118. In 1, 1 through 13, his focus is on the logos and its relationship to the world, and his speech is in the third person. He is describing the activities of others. However, in 1, 14 through 1, 18, his speech is in the first person. He notes we in verses 14 through 16, such as we beheld his glory. So the second point along that is that the word does not become flesh until verse 14. So this is denoting when the word becomes flesh and the ministry of Jesus. And prior to that is about the logos and its relationship to the world. So what beginning are we talking about? I believe that Trinitarians should agree with us that what's being spoken about is the beginning of creation seeing that all things have come through the Logos, and without the Logos, nothing was made, describing the creative activity of God. The Trinitarian's argument is essentially, if the Logos existed before creation, the Logos cannot be created, therefore the Logos is God due to its nature of being uncreated. In other words, they will argue essentially the Logos must have always existed because it existed before creation. So we really want to ask ourselves, when did time begin? Philo speaks on this in his book on the creation. He writes, quote, Moses says also, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, taking the beginning to be not as some men think, that which is according to time, for before the world, time had no existence, but was created either simultaneously with it or after it. For since time is the interval of the motion of heavens, there could not have been any such thing as motion before there was anything which could be moved. It therefore follows also of necessity that time was created either at the same moment with the world or later than it, and to venture to assert that it is older than the world is absolutely inconsistent with philosophy. So Philo argues that time began when the heavens were put into motion, and the heavens were put into motion according to which the blueprint that God produced prior to setting everything into motion. So this creates quite a conundrum because if time didn't exist, but yet God was active, if there was a succession of events prior to time existing, it seems that some form of time must have existed. Recommended reading on this is 
the end of a, the timeless God by R.T. Mullins. Now, I don't really agree with everything he says here because I don't think we should seek to put God in a box as far as what time is. But two conclusions we can draw from the Bible itself is one, that time began when the heavens were set into motion, and two, that God was active and that there was a succession of events prior to time beginning as we know it. So in the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was already in existence when God began to create. The Logos was present before the beginning of creation. And we can compare this to Proverbs 8. Wisdom says, I was there before anything was brought forth. Before God did anything, I was already there. But the contrast is that the law of Moses did not exist before creation. The law of Moses was temporal and given for a certain duration to a certain people for a certain purpose. And the Logos was prostanteon. The Logos was with God. Concerning the word prost, Peter Phillips notes, in classical usage, pros is used to express motion towards an object. Some examples in the New Testament include 2 Corinthians 3.4. We read, now we have such confidence through Christ toward God. Prostantheon. Also in the book of John, knowing that the Father has given him all things into his hands and that he came forth from God and he's going to God. Prostantheon. So the argument put forth by Daniel Wallace and also Trinitarians is that because of the grammatical structure of the sentence, which we won't go into here. They note that pros in the prologue denotes proximity, so a certain closeness or relation with God. But we shouldn't really have a problem with this if we understand the logos such as wisdom and see that wisdom was with God and was daily his delight. And so we can read this, that the logos was in intimate relation with God and was also direct toward the one true God. Next we read, and the Logos was God. Now this is a part of the verse which trips a lot of people up. It's very hard to understand until we get some background context for what's being said. Now in the Greek, it reads something like, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with the God, and the Logos was God. So in the first instance of God, there's an article in front of the God, which reads something in English like the God. The Logos was with the God, but when the Logos is described as God, it's widely noted the absence of the article. So scholars go to great lengths and attempt to understand what John meant here. And they would say something like, the Logos was with the God and the Logos was qualitatively God, whatever they mean by that. But this very dynamic is already put forth before the Gospel of John was written by Philo. He writes, quote, it is the true God that is meant by use of the article, the expression being, I am the God. But when the word theos is used incorrectly or catechistically, figuratively, it is put without the article. And what he calls God without the article is his most ancient logos. So Philo attempts to explain how it is that God 
cannot be seen yet in some places god appears and god somehow is seen and when we look back on that it's easy to see from our traditional understanding how an angel appeared and so this may be a secondary being alongside god such as an angel or the trinitarians would believe the second person of a trinity but an article i have to recommend here which helps us get a better understanding of where philo is coming from and then in turn john but an article i have to recommend by drago's julia which is summarized in the study of philo annual put out by david renea is an article titled the noetic turn in jewish thought he summarizes the article quote by noetic turn the author means the reconceptualization of biblical and apocalyptic ontological and epistemological categories for example god angels heavens generally thought of according to the norms of everyday knowledge into noetic categories the heavenly mysteries are understood not by direct vision hearing dreams but by noetic perception this development introduces new ideas about the nature of the realities of the heavenly world about revelation about human capacity for noetic perception it begins with philo who introduces plato's distinction between the noetic intellectual and the sense perceptible into jewish thought thus while philo still holds to the notion of heaven as the place of divine indwelling access to that realm is to be attained through noetic perception in place of the biblical apocalyptic categories transportation to heaven direct vision dreams or other methods of access philo has the intellect make the upward journey to the heavenly realm next we read he was in the beginning with god all things came into being through him and without him not even one thing came into being that has come into being and this is the first instance where we read of the logos being a he and many read this as further solidifying the idea that there was a person with god the pre-incarnate christ but concerning the same issue of the gender of wisdom and logos philo writes this quote let us then pay no heed to the discrepancy in the gender of the words and say that the daughter of god even wisdom is not only masculine but father sowing and begetting in souls aptness to learn discipline knowledge sound sense good and laudable actions so philo's telling us that we shouldn't be concerned with the gender of a word even though wisdom is called a she and the same is true for the logos and what's interesting here is also that philo calls wisdom the daughter of god philo also notes that wisdom is also the wife of god and so we have quite an interesting dynamic there if we take these relations literally and so also with the logos who he calls the son of god we shouldn't take literally so to understand the use of the masculine logos in john in place of the feminine sophia we first should go further into philo to understand how he explains the contrast between the feminine and masculine for philo as we'll see the feminine began to be associated with the sensible 
in the masculine with the intelligible. Here's an excerpt from an interesting article titled The Passion of Eve and the Ecstasy of Hannah by Scott Mackey. He writes, quote, according to Philo's reasoning, the senses resemble women in a number of ways. They are passive, prone to deception, and the source of debilitating emotions and sinful pleasures. The passions are similarly portrayed as feminine and inimical to virtue. And just as the masculine mind must control the feminine senses and emotions for a person to function properly, so also women, if they wish to advance in virtue and wisdom, must be controlled and led by men into a figurative transformation of their femininity one involving the suppression of the womanly senses and emotions and the acquisition of masculine reasoning power. But to show how the masculine and feminine complement each other, just as the sensible and intelligible, he goes on to say, positively, the man mind and the woman senses were intended to function in mutuality, each necessary for the other's fulfillment. Without the senses, mind was blind, incapable, and truly powerless. It was but half the perfect soul. When God finally granted the mind the power of sense perception, it was illuminated and enlightened. Similarly, the union of men and women represents a harmonious coming together since everything that is without a woman is imperfect and a ruin. So it is with the law of Moses. Our senses, just like the law of Moses, should lead us to reason. But the law of Moses, just like our senses, can also lead to our destruction. And so what John is doing here is he's equating the law of Moses with a sensible revelation, but with an underlying reason, which is the masculine immutable logos of God. And the law of Moses should lead us to reason, but it can, and as we will see for some, perhaps most leads to their destruction. Next, we read, in him, the Logos was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Here's a great excerpt from The Meaning of Light in the Gospel of John, a master's thesis by Scott Davis. He writes, quote, the fact that light illuminates things which are otherwise in darkness is used in many ways in the Old Testament. Within this broad category, light is seen to shine into the darkness, enable people to see, reveal hidden things, and show the way to go. But when light is withheld, people are unable to see, hidden things are not revealed, and people do not know the way to go. Also worth mentioning is what is said about wisdom in the Book of Wisdom of Solomon 729-30, through 30, he writes, For wisdom is more beautiful than the sun and excels every constellation of stars. Compared with the light, she is found to be superior, for it is succeeded by the night. But against wisdom, evil does not prevail. So we see the same theme continued and already spoken about in wisdom as well. So concerning the Greek word for overcome there, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This word in the Greek can mean either to comprehend or overtake. But here as in the rest of John, John often implements words that can be understood in more than one way. Concerning this 
word in the Greek here for overcome. James Resigui notes in his book, The Strange Gospel, quote, it is not merely that both meanings make sense in 1.5. It is that both meanings are required to grasp the ideological perspective of the gospel. Darkness is both uncomprehending of the light and also hostile to the light. Next we read, there came a man having been sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness that he might testify concerning the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might witness concerning the light, the true light who enlightens every man coming into the world. This is the first interruption by John in the prologue. And Peter Phillips notes this and also notes a second interruption that we'll address in verse 15. But here in the Gospel of John, John is identified as a light, but not the light. And in John 5, Jesus says, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. John was a lamp that burned and gave light and you were willing for a season to bask in his light. So here we see the first instance of new creation imagery. John here is going to be, as we'll see, representative of the sun, which bears witness to the intelligible light. Here's what I mean. So before understanding this dynamic, we first have to go back again to Genesis 1. And on the first day of creation, God says, let there be light. But it wasn't until day four that God creates the sun. So the question naturally arose, how was there light or what is this light that was brought forth prior to the sun? So to understand this dynamic, we have to go back again to Genesis 1 and the creation account. On the first day, God said, let there be light. But it wasn't until the fourth day that God created the sun. So the question naturally arose, how is it that light could have existed before the sun? Or what kind of light was it that existed before the sun? If Philo understands this as God first creating an intelligible light, which served as a model for the sun, and the same way the sun nourishes life, so also the intelligible light nourishes our spiritual life. Philo writes, quote, And after the shining forth of that light, perceptible only to the intellect, which existed before the sun, then its adversary darkness yielded, as God put a wall between them and separated them, well knowing their opposite characters and the enmity existing between their natures. And again, when we go back and we see the darkness has not overcome it, we see here also he notes the opposite characteristics of light and darkness and how God put separation between them. George Van Kooten comments this on his book, The Creation of Heaven and Earth. He says, quote, this light, the intelligible light, was an incorporeal and mental paradigm of the sun and of other heavenly luminaries. God says this light is beautiful for the reason that as a mental intelligible light, which is discernible by the mind, it surpasses the visible in the brilliancy of its radiance. Next we read, he was in the world, or the cosmos, and the world came into being through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he gave them authority to be children of God, 
to those believing in his name who are born not of blood nor of will of flesh nor of will of man but of god so the word here world cosmos can refer to an orderly unit such as the universe or the earth but also is used to refer to humanity or the people who live on earth and there's often dispute about who exactly is being referred to when it says that he came to his own and his own did not receive him but as many as received him but we should keep in mind that prior to verse 14 the logos his interaction with the cosmos is not limited to one group of people or even the disciples, but is a reference rather to anyone throughout time. And also, as Dr. Dustin Smith points out here in this passage, there is a chiasm structure to the passage with the focal point being becoming a child of god the main focal point of the entire prologue is about being a child of god of course the jews believe that they must be a physical descendant of abraham in order to be a child of god but jesus explains how this is not so which we will get into in chapter 8 but also concerning being a child of god philo writes but they who have real knowledge are properly addressed as the sons of the one god as Moses entitles them, where he says, Ye are the sons of the Lord God, and again, God who begot thee, and in another place, is he not thy father? And even if there is not yet anyone who is worthy to be called a son of God, nevertheless, let him labor earnestly to be adorned according to his firstborn logos. And so what Philo is saying here, as John's also saying here, is that in order to become a god, you must first be adorned or put into order according to the Logos, which is the reasoning of God, the reasoning through which God created and what God intended for the cosmos. Next we read, and the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, a glory as of an only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The theological significance that we're going to want to grasp here is that the intelligible and corporeal logos has crossed over into the sensible corporeal. So that which we were supposed to be led to through the sensible, the intelligible has now come into the sensible and the disciples write that we have beheld his glory. And this is also echoed in First John. It's been widely noted that the Greek word here for dwelt is also used in the book of Sirach concerning wisdom. Sirach 24.8, Then the creator of all gave me wisdom, his command, and my creator chose the spot for my tent or for my dwelling or for my tabernacling. Barbara Ellen Bow writes this in her book, The Wisdom of Creation, quote, When the prologue of John claims that the word became flesh and made his dwelling, skinoo, or pitch a tent among us, this is surely an unmistakable borrowing from Sirach in order to say about Jesus as the word made flesh what the tradition had said long ago about wisdom, thereby comparing, even equating the two. John 1.15, John witnesses concerning him, and he cried out, saying, This was he of whom I was saying, The one coming after me has precedence over me because he was before me. Peter Philip notes again here, John the Baptist interrupts the prologue again. He intervened once before after a prolonged period of description about the identity of eternal logos. So many people reading this verse on a natural level use it to justify the idea that Jesus 
is superior to John because he pre-existed him. But when we go back to the, the beginning of the prologue and we understand the background behind what's being said, with John as the sensible revelation, what is being said in the Gospel of John is that Jesus has precedence over John because he's the intelligible representation of God the same way the Torah is the sensible revelation of God, but the Logos is the intelligible revelation. So also John as representing the son is saying that Jesus has precedence because he is the embodiment of the intelligible light. John 1, 16 through 18. For from his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever yet seen God, the only begotten God, the one being in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. So two things we want to look at here in this passage First, we read that grace and truth came through Jesus. Also, we read that no one has ever yet seen God. The only begotten God has explained him. Concerning grace, the Greek word there for grace is charis. And many scholars have noted the illusion in parallels with Exodus 33 through 34 in the Septuagint. Along the same line, we're going to read a quote from Alexander Susero from his book titled Glory, Grace, and Truth. He writes, quote, The message of Exodus 33, 12 through 34, 10, the Old Testament covenant of Charis is clear. God's Charis is the very presence of the divine, it unfolds itself in multiple ways. The divine presence of Charis is attested when God reveals himself so that me, he may be evidently be seen and known. When the Lord lets people know his ways that people may know him, it becomes comprehensible when God manifests his doxa or his glory, his character. God's presence, Charis, is experienced when he leads the people and gives rest and goes before and with the people. The Lord's presence, or Charis, is at work when the people are glorified beyond all the nations. This great nation remains God's people. God's presence, Charis, is encountered when the Lord takes away the sins and iniquities of the people. The Lord evinces the establishment of the covenant of his charis in the presence of all people by doing glorious things that have not been done in all the earth or in any nation. All the people see the works of the Lord, that they are marvelous. And I encourage you to go and read Exodus 33 and through 34 and compare it with what you're reading in John 1, 14 through 18. Also concerning the word truth, which we find all throughout the Gospel of John. But in the book Spirit and Truth, the author writes, Greek thought called Aletheia, the supreme divine and eternal reality. So it's not just that God's favor has come to people to humanity to the world but also the supreme divine and eternal reality has also come through jesus and lastly concerning the phrase no one has ever seen god i like this from harry atridge he writes quote at the end of his prologue stands an affirmation with which philo would certainly agree that no one has ever seen God. Immediately following is something that Philo would find parallel to his own epistemology, yet quite challenging, that 
The only son who is at the father's bosom has made him known. Two things are of interest in this verse, the denial of the possibility of a direct vision of God and the affirmation that knowing God is possible, but through some form of instruction implied by the verb exegasado. A translation such as made known through a process of textual explication would reflect the word's etymology. And interestingly enough, Philo's position on the role of the Torah. So again here, Jesus becomes the locus of God's revelation and is replacing the Torah as the intelligible reason to which the Torah was supposed to lead us to. On the next episode, we'll be wrapping up John chapter 1. Focusing especially on John one twenty three, which reads, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am a voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Many people see this verse as a reference to Jesus being Yahweh, but when we get into the text, explore the background, we'll really be able to illuminate the text and understand what it truly means. Until then, God bless.